seeing you and Swap. 12 o'clock. <laughs> All right, 12 o'clock. I'm using the lines. We're getting started right on time here. All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webcast today. My name is Ed Kless, and with me today are Ron Baker and Tom Hood, who I'll remind to please unmute your phone, guys, star six. Our uh, session today is Scientific Management and Other Leading Techniques for a Modern CPA Firm. Uh, we have a hashtag set up there at Great CPE, so if you're playing at home, uh, the home game here, please go ahead and uh, tweet away, and, and uh, we'll, we'd be happy to to look at any tweets that you come up with after that great CPE. Uh, there's lots of fun features that you have in this conference session. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. You certainly can send chat into us. Uh, since I have muted everyone, uh, uh, there's uh, some people coming in. They are not on the line, uh, not, not muted. So if you've just joined us, please mute your line uh, by hitting star six or your mute button on your phone. That will work as well. Um, you can unmute to talk to us if you like, and that, again, is the star six command. That's a mute, unmute function. But uh, we'd like to, to get started today. So I'm going to introduce <clears throat> to you a, a, this topic of uh, scientific management in, in a modern firm. And I, I, I figure the best place to start with is, a, is one of the best quotes uh, about this idea. If there's anything that scientific management is about, it's about the idea of efficiency in an organization and how important uh, these, these things are. So I figured I'd, I'd find, I, look, I went through and searched, and I found this great quote, I thought, um, on, on efficiency and, and its importance. And that is, I knew I could control one thing, and that is my time and my hours and my effort and my efficiency. And, of course, we know the great uh, works that, uh, that uh, Ryan Seacrest has been able to contribute to the world um, using this mantra. I'm sure this is something that he is uh, – uh, constantly thinking about and uh, making sure that, that the work that he's doing and the television shows that he's producing are extraordinarily efficient. Um, so anyway, that's, that's just the share. And I, and I want to share with you a little bit about where this quest began uh, that I, I have, this passion for understanding efficiency in professional firms and, and, and really making it work. Um, and it, it all started when I, I read a book called uh, Zero, the, the uh, autobiography of a dangerous idea. And in this book, the author, uh, William Seif, um, has a really interesting uh, contribution, and that is he, he talks about the word uh, logos. And what you're seeing up here, up there in the, the top right-hand corner, I'm sorry, left-hand corner, is the Greek word logos, and how the word logos in Greek translates to word. Okay, pretty uh, or one of, the, one of the translations. But the other translation, which is actually more prevalent in, in, uh, in, in ancient times, is to translate the word logos into the word ratio. Um, in fact, the word logic, right, logos, logic, the word logic comes from uh, this, this idea of, of logos, so being based on this idea of, of a ratio. So one thing that, that Seif posits in this book is to, is to say that, hey, we could substitute this very famous quote from the first gospel of, of John um, to, and substitute in, the, in for the word word, the word ratio. Um, and, I, and I think that this was a really powerful for me to understand this idea that in the beginning was the ratio, right? In the beginning was the way that we related two things together uh, and how those two things began. And the ratio was with God. And the ratio even was God. Um, and, and how critical it is to understand the relationships between um, things and understanding how, what our impact is on, on both of those. Um, I read a little bit further about, about this idea of, of efficiency and what it means and, and came across Thomas Sowell, who, who had a quote that said that there is no such thing as generic efficiency. Um, I dispute that. I don't think that that's, that's right. I think that we can, we can clearly just have a generic efficiency as defined as this, right? Inputs divided by outputs. That's generic efficiency. So whatever the inputs are, the outputs. But I didn't think that this was enough because it's really not just always inputs and outputs per se. There are, there are other things that are going on. So I think a better way 
to substitute in the idea of efficiency is the is versus the ought, right? So the, so the, the two numbers that we're going to be measuring in any kind of generic efficiency, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you a couple of, of uh, efficiency metrics that I think are, are critically important in professional firms a little bit later on uh, today after Ron, Ron talks about the importance of timesheets, because really the, the metrics are, are based on having a, a great understanding of, of timesheets. Um, so he's going to talk about that first. But it's really this idea of the difference between the is and the ought, right? I mean, this, these are the things that ought to be. You ought to bill 2,080 hours a year, right? That's kind of like the, that's what the, that's what ought. And of course, then the is on top of that is what it is that you actually do. So I, I really think that this is ought parallel is a, is a good one for this idea of generic efficiency and increasing the topic. I mean, my wife tells me all of the time that, that this idea of efficiency is one that she holds dear for inside of our marriage, right? I mean, she's always saying, hey, this is, Ed, who you ought to be, and then this is who you are. So her the efficiency metric um, in our household is, is a pretty important one. She kind of lets me know where I stand on this efficiency as a husband. You know, you're about 70% today. You're about 50% today. But it, it's, it's important because, you know, it's this whole is versus ought thing. Now, I'm going to have more to say on this subject and how this directly relates to project management um, in a few moments. But first, I'm going to uh, pass control over to uh, Ron Baker. And uh, Ron is going to talk about why timesheets are critical. So, Ron, are you uh, unmuted? I am, Ed. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to advance the slide. Oops, i got to fix that S. All right. Never mind. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The S is wrong on your – but just go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, folks, this is uh, – I'm going to deal with what why timesheets are critical. So I'm going to lay out the, the justifications for it. And like Ed was talking about with efficiency, uh, to also give you some more historical background on this, and Ed, you can go to the next slide. Um, the father of efficiency was Frederick Winslow Taylor. And he wrote the definitive book on this that I, I highly recommend that you all read called The Principles of Scientific Management. You can get this on Amazon. You can even get it free because it's past the publication, the copyright. Uh, and Taylor developed the scientific method principles, and it became known as Taylorism. He was kind of an interesting guy. He grew up in the northern suburbs of Philadelphia, and, you know, he was always into measurement. And that's a big part of what Ed was saying uh, and, and I think what Tom is going to say as well is how important it is to measure things. I mean, measure is, is the measurement is everything. The ratio of outputs to inputs is everything. And, and Taylor would even go as a child to, to like a high school or even a junior high dance, and he would develop charts of the, of the pretty girls and the not so pretty girls, and he made sure that he spent an equal amount of time with all of them, with each group. I thought, God, well, that, that's great. I mean, here's this young kid doing this, and, and it's, it's, it's really kind of interesting the way he just measured everything. But Taylorism is defined as the application of scientific methods to the problem of obtaining maximum efficiency in your work. And kind of like what Ed was saying, maximum efficiency, it's a ratio. We're trying to get more outputs with less inputs. And, and that's the big goal here, to make people work more efficiently, to use less resources, and, and to put out more outputs. So again, I would highly recommend that you, you take a look at the, uh, the book, The Principles of Scientific Management, because it really lays this out in a very coherent framework. And I'm actually going to give you the framework here. Uh, but, uh, Ed, if you go to the next slide, just to give you an idea of Taylor's principle, is in, it, it, one of the first things he states in the book is that in the past, the man has been first, and in the future, the system must be first. The first object of any good system must be that of developing first-class men. In other words, if you put a great worker in a bad system, you're not going to get maximum efficiency. So you have to think about the system, and that's where Frederick Taylor's genius came in. I mean, he walked around. His first job was with the Midvale Steel Company, and he'd walk around with a, a stopwatch, and he would time men uh, doing various tasks, and he would figure out ways to have them do those tasks faster and more efficient to save time. And, of course, that would free up capacity. And these ideas are just as relevant today as they were back in the 1880s because if you think about it, if a CPA firm can be more efficient, it can free up capacity, it can do more work with less people, 
So its wages are going to be lower, and its profit is obviously going to be higher. It's, it's, it's going to be able to take on more clients. It's going to be able to bill more hours in, in the same amount of, 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 of time period, of a fixed day. So Taylor was very insistent on putting the system first. And, and then if we go to the next slide, just to give you a little bit more historical context on, on the genius of, of Frederick Taylor, is, is Peter Drucker, somebody that I, I think the three of us on this call, certainly Tom and, and Ed, uh, have great respect for Peter Drucker. Drucker says or wrote that Taylor's scientific management idea is perhaps the most powerful as well as the most lasting contribution America has made to Western thought since the Federalist Papers. I mean, that's quite a statement, and, and I think it's absolutely true. I mean, this idea, scientific management, changed the world. Germany used it. Uh, Stalin in Russia used it. Lenin used it. it. Mussolini used it. I mean, a lot of people, you know, say the trains ran on time because of Frederick Taylor's influence on Mussolini. In fact, Frederick Taylor's widow met Benito Mussolini. So, I mean, this was a powerful worldwide idea. That, that increased efficiency throughout the business world, through, throughout factories around the world. And, and really, you can, you can credit our high standards of living to the ideas of Frederick Taylor. So he is quite a thinker. And then if we go to the next slide, that, that one of the things that grew out of Frederick Taylor was what's known now as the McKinsey maxim, which says what you measure, what you can measure, you can manage. And we've all heard this before. We're all CPAs or all accountants all finance people, we understand this. You have to be able to measure something if you want a management, much like Ed was talking about in his marriage, or it, it, you know, if you want to become a better golfer, if you want to lose weight, if you want to do any of these things, you have to be able to measure. The measurement is everything. And uh, you know, the McKinsey maxim is, 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 is right on. So taking that idea, Ed, if you go to the next slide, let me lay out for you the, the – uh, Taylor scientific system, and I, and I think this is really interesting. The first thing you got to do is you got to break down a job into its component parts. You got to tear it apart. You got to like if it's an audit or a tax return. What are the things that need to be done? You see surgeons do this. This applies just as much to knowledge work as it does to factory work. So you break down a job into its component parts, and then the second thing, and if you show that, is that you time each of those parts with a stopwatch and to find out just how quickly they can be achieved by the quickest and most efficient workers. So Taylor had this concept of the ideal worker. He actually gave this person a name. You'll read this when you read the book. And this was the benchmark. This was the benchmark everybody was measured against was the quickest worker. And, and that would inspire everybody, incentivize everybody to work to that, to that efficiency standard. And then the third thing, uh, if you look at it, is get rid of any parts of the job that aren't necessary. And this is a big part of I'm sure you've heard of Lean or Six Sigma or even maybe the Toyota production system. This is the big part of waste. There's enormous waste, uh, whether it's waste in movements, whether it's waste of time, you know, people checking social media, people tweeting, uh, people making personal calls. You know, all of these things are, are just efficiency killers and, and Taylor was really insistent that we get rid of any of those parts of the job that aren't necessary. And you can break down any task in a, in a CPA or an accounting firm, and you can find things that are absolutely just time wasters. And he said get rid of them. And then if we go to the fourth thing, that and this is interesting, and this is actually the most contested part of scientific management, he wanted you to add in about a 40% uh, the fudge factor, he didn't use that term, but he said 40% of the time for unavoidable delays. I mean, not everything's going to be running at perfect efficiency, and 40% is a lot. And there's a lot of people that challenged that and said, no, no, that's way too high. You can't do that. But if you look at Taylor's experiments, and they're really well documented and they've been replicated, then you can see that he did add 40%. But what he also said, and this is what most people miss about his system, he says, over time, scientific management will take that 40% to zero. So he didn't want to start people out 
with the idea that you reach maximum efficiency right out of the gate. He wanted you to get there gradually. And so that's why he put in that 40% fudge factor. Now, you'll read more about this in the book, um, but, you, but I think you'll be convinced uh, of, of the logic behind this. And then if we go to point five, then he said, you're going to organize your pay system so that the most efficient people can earn consistently more money by meeting the optimum times while the average have to struggle to keep up. So he, he, was, he was the one that invented the piecemeal system with quotas. And if you ran above that quota, you would get the additional compensation on all of your production, not just the marginal production above the quota. And that was a revolutionary concept because he wanted to harmonize the interests of the worker with the owners. He didn't think there was a big um, conflict between, you know, labor and, and ownership, like, uh, like say, Karl Marx thought during the time. He thought those interests could be harmonized. And so one of the things he did was he looked at the pay of the workers, and, and I think that's a, a very interesting model. So you're also going to see that in his book as well. And if we go to the next slide, Hey Ron, before you go, before you yeah. go on, just uh, got sure. maybe a question or two on on this, especially with regard to number two in the stopwatch. I mean, I think now's the time, right? With with things like, I mean, I have an app on my cell phone that 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 uh, is the automatic stopwatch for things and countdown clock. So what I might do is, as a worker, I might, you know, put myself on the clock. Uh, for a particular, I don't know, tax return or some kind of piece, you know, the piece that you break this down in and, you know, set it. So, like, you know, five, I, I should only do this this thing in five minutes, right? So put that down and then I can count it down. Then I can, you know, operationalize myself against that. So, I mean, it, the, we have great individual tools available today, um, you know, the individual stopwatch, which was just unthinkable in Taylor's time. Absolutely. And in fact, I can tell you that there's some very interesting apps that have come out. There's actually some law firms and some accounting firms that have instituted a, 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 an idea kind of similar to what you're talking about, where their screen will actually turn red, green, or yellow, depending on whether or not they're meeting their time quota for various tasks that they're performing. So mm. the computer and the app keeps track of exactly what it is you're doing. Let's like, say it's a tax return. Then it's going to know how many hours or how many minutes you should be on that. And if you're not, if you're not meeting your quota, your screen is going to start to slowly turn yellow or even red. And, and people can even then walk around and see where everybody kind of stands in real time. And that, that's really interesting. So, yes, because yeah, of technology, yeah. we're seeing some it's great things there. It was sort of like the McDonald's that I was in, in in New York City that had you know not only this it was a big big huge line but over every every uh, uh, cashier was the average serve time for that cashier. So right. it was great because you could you could walk in and you could go okay well this line's a little bit longer oh but this one's a little bit this one's a little bit longer but the average serve time is significantly less so you're able to like better position yourself as a customer. You know, so I, mean, I guess you can right. even turn these metrics over to customers so that customers would be able to um, see, you know, each of your workers and, and which one are the most efficient. So they, they can even give you feedback and say, well, I want this guy on my, my tax return because he's more efficient. Absolutely. And you see this even with uh, supermarket checkout counters. They have that technology. I think in yeah. fact, it's censored developed it where it tracks how fast the checker scans things. So people say, oh, but that, you know, but then the checker can't talk to you. Well, so what? They can scan your, your products really fast and get you out. It makes your day more efficient. Right. Awesome. Awesome. And it, well, 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 let me just just quick pause here. And I didn't see any typed in. Are there any questions for for Ron, Tom, did you have any thoughts on this before Ron moves on? Well, I think the, the, you guys were just talking about it, but it, I never really thought about it, how that could apply to a professional services firms like CPAs. But I think you're right. In today's busy world, your customers really don't want to talk a lot. They just want to get their stuff done and get out. Right. Absolutely. Right. Okay. All right. Bye, Ron. Here you go. Here's the next slide. Okay, and I know this is close to the end, but I want to give you guys four reasons why timesheets are absolutely critical for the for the running of any professional firm. I don't care if you're an accounting firm, a law firm, an advertising agency, or bookkeeping firm, wherever you're from. Because of the Taylor's scientific management principles, uh, there's four reasons why timesheets are critical. First off, they're a pricing tool. I mean, how could we price without knowing how long something is going to take? We'd never know if the price was right. We'd never know 
you know, if 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 we're we're getting the, the the value from what we're creating, unless we keep that time. So we need them as a pricing tool. That I think that's fairly obvious. Everybody agrees with that. Then if you look at the second reason, they are definitely a cost accounting tool. In fact, the timesheet was introduced not so much as a pricing tool, it was actually introduced as a cost accounting tool because it was a way to measure the profit. Well, luckily, after we started measuring the profit and measuring the time, then that time became the inventory of what we sold, and that then obviously the timesheet morphed into the pricing tool. So these two are kind of hand in glove now, and you definitely need the timesheet to know if you're profitable on any one job. And we should be able to look at the profit on a, on a you know, on a job by job, or even if you want to break it down this far on a minute by minute basis and see everybody's level of profitability on, on that micro of a scale or sometimes called granular scale. And then the third reason that timesheets are so important is because Without them, how would you know the efficiency of your professionals? You wouldn't have anything to benchmark. So we're kind of back to the McKinsey maxim that if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And, and I have no idea how to measure uh, a professional unless they filled out a timesheet. And I could see what they were doing, you know, on a day-by-day basis to see if they were efficient. I can compare one to the other so I, I know if, if person A is more efficient than person B. And this is critical information to have for not only pricing decisions, but profitability decisions and also compensation decisions and and who is going to be promoted and who's going to make partner and and, and decisions like that. And then the fourth and last reason that timesheets are so important is because they're a project management tool. How could you possibly, and Ed's going to talk much more about this, but how could you possibly do project management if you didn't have, again, that benchmark of time to see how well a project was progressing as, as you were doing it. So it's kind of like a real-time tool to see hey, how are we doing on this job. And if, in the absence of that, I, I don't know how you could do it. So those are the four reasons why timesheets are absolutely critical. And you can see more about this. I've written some stuff about it. But you, you can see more about this in the books I've written. But I, I'm going to turn this over to Ed. Uh, and this is all my contact information, but I'm going to turn this over to Ed, and he's going to talk more about the project management component. All right. Awesome, Ron. Thank you. And, and I think that, you know, that, that's a, a great feed-in for what I'm going to talk about, which are some, the, the, the you know, efficiency in professional project management. And just, just as Ron said, we, we need the basis for this, absolutely critical, is is the timesheet. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really think that, that the ideas of, of um, you know, capturing it exactly as it is, is, is so important here. And, and, you know, Taylor's idea of, hey, the 40% is going to come out in the wash over time. The better you get at measuring this stuff, the, the much better off, off you'll be. So th- thanks, Ron. Um, Thank you. So what I'm, uh, I'm talking about is uh, some things here. There's there are a couple things here. And there's lots and lots of, of um, uh, acronyms, or actually they're not really acronyms. These, the acronyms that you actually pr- can pronounce, like SCUBA is an acronym. But uh, these are initializations because you just usually say them. So BAC, uh, you don't say back in in, um, in project management. You say you say BAC, which is budgeted completion. So this is that what is the budgeted amount at the actual completion of the project, right? So that's the one one metrical need. And how else would you do that without a timesheet? I mean, really. And then the actual costs to date. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The actual cost of data is what you need the timesheet for. The budget, of course, is what you you need that the, the timesheet accumulation from all of the past projects that you've worked on to be able to tell what this is going to take in uh, the future, you know, and then you usually add about uh, 10% or so because, it, you know, there's going to be differences between the one, uh, maybe more than 10%, but what maybe 40% is the place to, to start off with that. So we take our actual cost today. So we need our budget at completion, our actual cost to date, um, and then we can do some really interesting calculations based on this, the plan value, earn value, cost variance, and these are the formulas for them. The, the scheduled variance, the cost performance index, which is these last two, really important because these, as you can see, this is these are the ratios, right? Right? And remember, the ratio is God. So we we have these are the ones that, that really give us an index of what's going on, and then of course the scheduled performance um, index as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take you through 
of these in, uh, in, in, in turn. So, so let's take a quick look. I've got my, the next slide coming up here. So here's some efficiency metrics. I'm going to give you some, the, uh, one example, but you can plug in your own numbers for this, however you, you want to go through this and, and uh, decide for yourselves how this would flesh out on any individual engagement. And as Ron said, you know, we foresee you getting a little bit more granule, uh, granular than this. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you an example that's a total project, but the smaller and smaller that you could break this up, the more small components, you know, even down to, I don't know, six or so minute increments of stuff that you can, you can create, the better off you'll be, because then you can measure these things at that granular level. But let's, let's just look at this at the base, the project level. This, so our, our budget of completion is $50,000 for this project. The, our actual costs so far are twenty thousand dollars, right? So that's what we've spent so far. We've spent twenty grand, one twenty thousand dollars. Now, we had planned at this point to be seventy-five percent complete of this project. So, this, so this is another thing that you need to track. So, in addition to the, your actual, uh, what what you're you, what you've actually completed, which is the next metric. You, in, all, in order to get these great uh, ratio analysis and details of this, you also have to, to track what your planned completion is. And of course, the simplest way to do that would just be to take um, you know, the, the time. So say we're two, this is a three-month project per, or four-month project, and we're three months of the way through it, right, just on a timeline. So our planned completion, 75%. So that's, that's where you would get that 75% because we're three months of the way through a four-month project. And then, of course, what we what we're, we're turn, what we find out is that we're only actually 25% completed with this. Um, and again, how would we track this? Um, well, perhaps with, with, with timesheets, but that might not always be the case, right, because your timesheets wouldn't necessarily line up with your actual completion. So you need a third metric to, that, that checks this from a, like a checklist perspective, and then weight each individual item based on, on, on how important you think they are, and then track whether or not that thing is done and then use that. So we've got our budget of completion, actual completion, planned percent completion, and then the actual completion percent. Now watch, here's where the, the magic really starts, right? And the first is to get the, your, what's your planned value, right? So this is, this is how much work should have been completed at this point in time, right, derived from the planned work at any moment in time. So with that, the formula for that is, is we take the 75 percent, of the $50,000. So our planned value at this point was 37.5, right? That's how much we planned we should have got recognized the value of. So that's PV, planned value. The next one is our earned value. So how much of this value have we actually earned? And in this particular project, right, it's 25%. That's what we, we have said. We've actually completed only 25% of this work. So again, times the $50,000 or 12,500, that's our earned value, right? So again, budget times 25%, that's our earned value. Now, we start to see where we can begin to use these things in, in more detailed formula, right? So our next, our next is what's, what's called the, um, the, the, the current value. So this is the actual, the 12,500 minus the 20 that we've actually spent. So in this project is in big trouble, right? big trouble because it's actually negative. It's $7,500 negative, right? We should be at $20,000, but we're only at actually twelve five. So the current value is negative. We actually create this negative value here, which is clearly a problem for this, this project. And then this is now um, our, the, 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 uh, our, the, the, share, the value here, the, the service value, which is the twelve five. again, that's the, uh, the earned value, minus the um, the plan value itself, right? So, and again, this particular project in, in pretty pretty bad shape, right? Because we've only completed this 12.5, and we should have, based on our planned completed, right? So the idea of a plan completed, so the difference between what we planned and what was scheduled. So I'm sorry, this is the scheduled value. So this project is even worse than the 7,500. So that's what the, the great thing about using the scheduled value is, is because you can now tell, well, it's not, it's worse than the 7,500. In this case, it's $25,000 really behind from a value perspective. And now really the two things that I think which are key, right, are the CPI, right, the, the current value index, um, that which then you take the, what's, what's the rate of the project performance versus the cost expectations in the given period. So in this case, it would be the 12.5 divided by, you see the power in that division, right, 12.5 divided by $20,000. 
So our, our cost projection index is 62.5%. So, you know, we're, 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 we're not even close on this one, not even close. And then this takes the last one, of course, is the piece de resistance really gets, gets to the heart of things, which is the, the performance index, right? The service performance, scheduled performance index, which takes the 12.5 and divides this by the uh, 37.5 or the planned value. So our scheduled, uh, uh, scheduled value di uh, divided by the planned value. And you can see this product is only, has only recognized 33% of its value so far. Um, so, you know, these very simple calculations, once you take them down, create a tremendous amount of insight, I think, in, in, into what's going on inside the organization. And now, and look, look, I'm just showing this at the project level. Can you imagine if you took this down to a couple, couple of other things, the granular phase level of a particular project, how, how you'd be able to see on a phase-by-phase -phase basis the comparison of this stuff, and then also to be able to, to then um, you know, think about this, having the schedule, a schedule performance index of every professional in your firm, all right? You could get down to that level where we would know the SPI of all of them and, and you know, be able to compare one versus the other as to who is really delivering ultimately the end value of what, what it is that we're talking about. So I, I hope you, that you can see in this short period of time that these, these six things are, are off the charts when it comes to getting a better information into the hands of, of managers inside your organization. But especially look at those last two, the current, the current performance index and the scheduled performance index, again, because they're ratios. And there is the, the, the ratio is what is critically important uh, from a management perspective. Um, I'm going to pause here to see. I don't see any uh, type-in questions, and, and we're we're um, 30 minutes through, so we're a little over halfway because we only got a 50-minute hour uh, with regard to CPE. So, um, oh, and it's now 31 past. So we, we have about uh, uh, 19 minutes left, um, and we have. So I have a couple of final thoughts, but now I'm going to pass control over to Tom. But do we have any questions? Yeah, Ed, well, Ed, not a question, more of a comment. But you know, the, the yeah. CPI and the SPI. This is so. You know, because it's driven by the timesheet and the efficiency ratios, it, it, it's so much better than just like, you know, firms talk about generic realization or utilization. But this right. is much more specific because you're really getting down into the, the, the ratios and the percentages of the value that you created as you go. So it's, mm -hmm. it, it's the epitome of what Taylor was talking about and the McKinsey maximum. I mean, you're really measuring this in real time and seeing it. Right, right, right. And there, there are those who argue, by the way, that, you know, like my plan can completion where I use three months of a four-month project, that, that that's somewhat arbitrary. But it's not. I mean, it, that's what it is, right? I mean, it's clear. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? All right, Tom. Take it away, and you just have to let me know when you want to advance. So. All right. Uh, so, Ed, I'm, I'm having uh, trouble seeing my, my uh, WebEx disconnected, but you got my slides. So. I do. I'm going to pull my slide deck up and just kind of go from there. So is the first slide the uh, corporate dilemma that talks about the whole training notion? No, it's Tom Hood, CPA, CITP, CGMA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we know who I am. Let's advance that one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, oh, the corporate dilemma, yes. Okay. There we go. Nice and this two. one actually, is, uh, I don't know if, um, I don't know if, Ron, you know this, but this was really one of the quotes you told me a long time ago, and I found it in a cartoon. Right, right. I think what I want to do is kind of talk about, I, you know, I love the the quote you started with, Ron, about the, the system develops the man. You have to, you know, the men need to be trained to work inside the system. Right. And uh, and so I think this whole efficiency thing and all, I'm going to relate kind of what we see in the training world. And some of this is some things that have actually changed my mind recently. But it starts with you're going to have to think about a systematic way of training your people. So that's what we start with, with, which is a lot of CPA firms I hear all the time going, you know, I don't want to train these people. If I train them, uh, what happens if they leave? And uh, right. as Ron, you always say, what if we don't train them and they stay? So I want to make the case for we need to take this, uh, these concepts of efficiency and the scientific method and make sure we're training our people in this stuff. So next slide. Ed is just kind of a preview of, I'm going to talk about a couple of key areas of research uh, that we've seen and actually why I think it's wrong. So I okay. want to uh, move to that next slide, which starts with three relatively recent pieces about learning. Uh, 
that talk about some of the different types of skills that they're seeing. Is this, this the one, one with is, the uh, analyst, Aberdeen the Group? Insight? Yep, the that's it. Insight, that one? Okay. Good. Yep, that's the one. So the Aberdeen Group talks about this idea of uh, just what you need learning, and, and I will talk a little bit about that because I think if we're going to make – make ourselves efficient, we have to make our learning efficient. And one of the ways you can do that is by asking people to, to learn on their own time and not take away billable time, right, from your uh, firm. So more and more we've got these on-demand webcasts and things like that. That could be done off hours and, uh, and not billable. That would then create that more, the ratio of billable time would actually go up um, from that standpoint. Then there's two other ones. One's in Ernst & Young about um, the latest shifts in talent management. And then CCH talked about how some of these firms are succeeding in a new economy. Now, what's interesting about these firms, and I want you to go to the next slide right now, is they talk about the importance of soft skills. And this also goes to uh, Tom Peters, who I've been a fan of for a while. And, you know, here's a tweet he sent out that said, if I see the term soft skills one more time, I'm going to barf. Those skills are the true hard skills, the ones that effectuate results. Now, he has a saying that says, hard is soft and soft is hard. And actually, we've re kind of rethought that. And looking at where we are and this idea of efficiency, we have to say hard is harder and soft is not needed. So that's kind of our new thinking about where this goes. And I'm going to go in a little bit deeper into how you might think about that in a more systematic way so that, again, you can – get your people progressing so that they are better and better for the system. And uh, ultimately, that's what we want to get to. All right, so next slide. This is, again, one of those things that we would say is wrong. You'll see uh, this is a research from uh, IBM and their chief human resource study. And I would argue that the far right where the pink is is actually wrong. The one that's really right is over there on the left, uh, managing labor costs, workforce performance, and efficiently allocating the workforce. I mean, Ed, both you and Ron just talked about how critical that is. And so, again, I would argue that this notion of efficiency, bottom left, um, and the stuff, evaluating performance, which is right in the middle, I mean, that's something we really need to be thinking more about. So I'm going to say ignore, you know, that kind of right side of that graph. I think this is where we're saying we would challenge this research from that standpoint. All right, so next slide is one of our favorite sayings that in this period of rapid change and increasing complexity, the winners are going to be people who learn faster than the rate of change and faster than their competition. And that's where I want to kind of share a, a, a systematic model. And then I'm going to talk about what should you should be teaching to, again, make, this, um, make your folks more efficient and make them fit the system even better. So next slide, we get to this notion of um, kind of four attributes we think are critical to systematically thinking about training, right? So one is a career path or the career ladder. Uh, it should be competency-based. What are the critical, you know, competencies are knowledge, skills, and abilities to do something. And um, you combine those, right? You, be, you create a curriculum. Here's what we need you to learn. And then I would argue that we can use the cloud for more efficiency. So rather than sending people away and, and losing all that billable time, you can do more things electronically, more things like WebExes, and you can even do them, again, off hours, which would make it even more important. So right, well, any, any time learning idea, right? You know? Absolutely. So think about efficiency. And if we could move all that time people are spending learning into non-billable, you know, or into not wasted time, that boosts mm -hmm. ratios, right? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Because, because I mean, otherwise, this this learning stuff is all killing the efficiency metrics that we were talked about earlier. Exactly. If you're sending people away on training, the travel time plus the time they're away, you know, all that is it's just you're losing billable hours. You're losing the, again your ratios, right? Your efficiency ratios. So mm -hmm. that's why I think the um, that's why the cloud is a critical component here, and this is how we go. So I want you to move to the next slide which is our model, at least this was our model, and I'm thinking we've, uh, we've now revised it based on this notion of efficiency. We used to call it the bounce. And our thinking was, you know, the first, this is based on a lot of Gladwell's work, Malcolm Gladwell, great book for everyone called Outliers. 
Gladwell had this theory, and it's it's been in other um, books and, and uh, theories from some great thought leaders, but the notion that it takes 10,000 hours to master a topic. So, you know, if you think about accounting, right, you graduate from, from school, you take the CPA exam, and then, really, if you think about the accounting career, 10,000 hours is a good five years. So 2,000 hours a year now, and again, this you can tie in all the efficiency ratios to that, but... So 10,000 hours is typically that five-year, seven-year is the time to progress, to learn your discipline. And then there was this phenomena where you became like a manager. You started to move to more people and projects. And our original thinking was that's when you had to augment those technical skills with, you know, the things that we just talked about, those soft skills, uh, as Tom Peters would call them. And that's why we say hard is harder, or maybe it's hard is getting harder, and so our thinking now is, actually, that's not right. The stuff on the, on the right side isn't helping efficiency. It's not contributing to the scientific discipline that we're talking about here. So I think what we have to do is move to the next model, and this is where, you know, where we say Gladwell was partially right. 10,000 hours is good. It's a good starting point. But instead of our bounce model, we call it the, the TTHUD model. So it says te technical training helping you develop. And so we actually think it's 10,000 hours plus 10,000 more hours. I mean, mm. if you think about the body of knowledge in accounting and tax, it's proliferating dramatically, right? Just in the last couple of years, we've got, you know, FIRF's ME coming out of uh, for the uh, replacing the OCBOA standards. We've got the new FASB PCC. I mean, we have five sets of accounting standards now, ISB, uh, ISB SME. GAP, GAP PCC, and the new AICPA for SME. That's five sets of standards. The tax code is going crazy. State taxes are getting crazy. So we think it's more like 20,000 hours of technical mastery. So we think Gladwell, in this case, would be, you know, half right. And so our idea is, is that kind of career progression, instead of kind of turning and becoming a bounce going up into that partner level, really you're increasing, but you're increasing with, like, major more and more technical knowledge so that you can be more and more efficient delivering those services to your clients. You know, less time researching, you know more things right at hand, all that stuff would contribute to that kind of technical mastery, as we would say. So we call it the TTHUD now. So you're, th you're thinking, uh, Tom, on this is that now it's, it's clearly uh, 10 years before people should start even thinking about getting into a management r role inside a, a, the, the new modern firm. Yeah, I would actually argue that we – I don't know that we really need managers. I think, we, you know, effectively if everybody's really efficient and there might be somebody just kind of like keeping track of stuff, but I think that role would be less. It would be like you have more leverage. So maybe one manager is managing 10 staff or two or three teams – instead of one, right? So that's how you can extend that whole efficiency model deeper and deeper in the firm, if you will. Got it. Okay. But so that's – so I think, you know, now relating this back to competency, let's go to the next slide. You know, originally there was research from the, from the CPA Horizons 2025 project uh, that we thought was pretty good, but now we started to really re-question that. So those, again, soft skills – the five things you see up there, now maybe technologically savvy stays, but the one that matters most is really this whole deep technical knowledge inside the practice or corporate specialty you're working in as a CPA. So again, that you know, notion of 20,000 hours of technical mastery to get to that point, and that's how we would say that stuff really works. Because so, this is what you think that, that, you know, customers are really wanting from their CPAs. I mean, they're not looking for leadership, not looking for communications, not really looking for strategic thinking, not really looking for collaboration. But it's the technical savvy and this, this ability to specialize. I mean, I think, right, they want their tax return done at the most efficient way possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they want, you know, the audit done efficiently. You're right. I, I don't know that they really want to sit and chat with their CPAs as much as they want to get the stuff done, right? The stuff that they don't know how to do, that they're mm -hmm. paying that specialist to really, really do. And so I, I think, you know, we've thought about this and said those things, those soft skills come le way late, if, if at all. I mean, there's just natural-born people that will end up rising to the top and running these firms. Yeah, they have it or they don't. I mean, let's just face it. Yes, it's, uh, I think we got to spend yeah. that more time 
you know, getting that technical mastery as we would put about it. So that's kind of how we thought about this, that really if you want training to support the system and training to support the efficiency, then we have to think about it kind of fundamentally differently. Okay. Wow, Tom, there's so much in here, but just uh, just let me make a couple observations. I mean, you're... Well, we you're only... Ron, 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 Ron. Oh, oh sorry. Yep, yep. We only have six minutes left, but go ahead. Yes. Okay, real quick. Just your thud model, just... just it's so much more leverageable than anything, and I, I just love how there's, there's just so much leverage built into that model. And, and your concept of training on your own time so the firm can be more efficient, I mean, it's just great to hear that from a state society leader such as yourself because you can facilitate that happening, which is going to make firms more efficient. And then, you know, the soft skill thing, I've never been a fan of Tom Peters anyway. And, you know, he, he started at McKinsey, the guy who came up with the, the Maxim, and how do you measure soft skills? Give me a break. So I, I, I really like this. Yeah, so I think they're, they're going to just naturally rise to the top. But, yeah, I think you're right. Let's, let's get any other questions from the group, and Ed, wrap this thing up. No, well, no. Let take do take your last slide, Tom. To how can we keep you? That, that that's fine. I, we just want to we want to just finish up right about ten till though. So something to talk to about that. That was just kind of the, that was just like the, those are like on the front and back end. That was just kind of our approach to, to again building out a systematic way. If there's one takeaway, it is to really think about your training to support your system, and to really think about it from an efficiency standpoint. So I'm I'm done. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Good. And we got about five minutes to go. So. We did have a question come in, uh, Rob Robert McKay, if you're still on the line. He says, um, these performance metrics are based on estimates. If the estimates are not correct, the measurements will have little value. Is there a scientific way to address these? And he says, sorry, he started typing in late. to be a little bit more efficient in your typing. But um, uh, is there a way to measure the accuracy of time, resources, and measurements? Well I, well, I think so. I mean, I think that that's where, the, where the, these new software tools come in, right? Um, you know, the, the whole idea of the screen blinking at, at you when you're when you seem to be slowing down. And, you know, maybe there's even, you know, some new, uh, you know, most most computers now have cameras in them and they, we could actually begin to track motions, uh, you know, and again, like Frederick Taylor, he was only one guy, right, walking around. And, and Ron, do you think this would work as if we can measure that with the camera on people? Absolutely. I, I think that's a great point. And, uh, you know, the other thing is I think you can double-check the accuracy. I mean, what's the carpenter say, right? Measure measure twice, cut once. Mm -hmm. Why not do some of these measurements twice to make sure that they're accurate because they're that important? Interesting. So uh, possibly like having someone do two sets of timesheets, maybe one – as they're, you know, as they're going, and then maybe one a week later to see if it's, it, it is still in alignment with that, or they change their mind about what they, maybe they remembered it differently. Yeah, I could even see shadow timekeepers too, where you could have maybe other team members keep time for, for their colleagues, and and that would hold people oh. accountable. Oh, we've okay. seen some firms yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, um, this is this is the, thanks, guys, and we're going to about three minute wrap up here. Like I said, I want to make sure that we're we've gotten gotten to the 50 minutes exactly. Uh, there's a couple of slides I just want to go through. This uh, is one of a series of things that Sage is uh, is coming out with our leadership education for accounting professionals. Although Tom, I think we're going to have to <laughs> rethink that after your presentation today. So. Um, uh, but anyway, thanks for the input on that, Tom. So we've got new technologies, of course, new trends and client expectations. Uh, we know that it's, it's dramatically different, that areas of specialization are, are important. Uh, but this is the new the, the website that we have launched, sage, na.sage.com slash leap, and that stands for Leadership Education for Accounting professional, Professionals, although, again, um, might have to re rethink that one. Uh, just, just to let you know a little bit more about what's going on here, I've got two more slides on this. Uh, this is uh, not your traditional uh, CPE classes, as you could clearly tell from today. We've got little things a little bit, uh, mix it up a little bit. Uh, we want to help you improve your customer relationships, stay current on uh, the emerging trends, especially maybe some technology stuff as we move forward. Uh, certainly grow your business. We want you to get uh, lots and lots of customers and, and build lots and lots of hours for, for all of those lots of customers. I think it would be good for everyone. Uh, and we certainly want to give the flexibility that you need. The whole live and online thing, I think, really gets to Ron's and uh, and Tom's point about, uh, you know, making sure that, that people are doing this off hours and not when they're supposed to be doing work for your specific firm. So we, we'll make sure that you have the opportunity to do that. And uh, 
Lastly, just the, just as an example, we do have the in-person stuff, although, you know, again, maybe not recommended uh, for that because it will in, will eat into the efficiency metrics we talked about. Be better for the, the, the webcast stuff like this. Well, you know, maybe we should – I'm going to take some feedback back to say we probably should schedule this at like 7 or 8 o'clock at night would be better. Um, so I'll, I'll take that as feedback. So we're not we're not eating again, again into the the billable time thing. And then of course on demand, which you know how great is that? That on demand could be at any time, doesn't matter when, um, and then people can do it um, when they get home at night. So yeah. even even better. Or on the weekends. Or, or yeah, or on the weekend. Right. On the weekend. On the weekend, on the weekend is is good too. And uh, so again, just as a reminder. Uh, this would be the Leadership Education for Accounting Professionals, our new URL, na.sage.com uh, slash leap. And, again, I want to thank our presenters, Ron Baker and Tom Hood. Really appreciate this. Um, hope, hope to see lots of tweets out there at uh, Great CPE. And um, looking forward to working with you again. Oh, I just see it went to 1250, so um, we're done. Thank